in my business, there's sort of this sense of uh, there is technical, real science writing, and then the popular stuff. The popular stuff is always understood to be, you know, not as good, not as important, watered down, sort of we're deigning to bring ourselves out into the masses only because we want your funding through your taxes and as a generous, nice effort to uh, help you understand what we're doing here in the, the uh, ivory towers. That, that's a, a bit of a cardboard characterization, but it, it's true nonetheless, this is what happened to Sagan uh, for uh, deigning to popularize science as he did. He was rejected for tenure at Harvard. Uh, he was rejected as a member of the National Academy of Science. Uh, I did a, a, a sort of a literature search on his publication rate, which was uh, for the duration of his entire career, uh, an average of uh, one peer-reviewed publication in a major scientific journal per month for 40 years. He had over 500 publications, including 50 in Science and Nature, uh, which are the two most, if you get one, that's it, you're tenured, you're good for life. And he had 50 and still rejected, why? Because it was clearly understood that he dared to popularize what scientists were doing. This is a huge mistake. Not because we need to keep the masses happy because they pay the science funding. That's not why. It's because part of science is being able to communicate what it is you're doing. And if you can't tell people what it is you're doing, you're not really doing science. It's not just collecting data. It's also synthesizing data into coherent theories, theories that people could understand. And since we're all on this journey together to try to figure out what it is we're doing and where we came from and where we're going and all that, then everybody should be in on it. And uh, you know, no secrets, no big conspiracies uh, that creationists think that there are. And this is why people think this. Oh, you guys, you evolutionists are you know, keeping down the secret intelligent design theory and you won't let kids hear about it in public schools or something. Forget it, that, just put it out there. Everybody can read about it. You can see there's nothing to it, right? So, um, so there, but there are stellar examples of people that do this well. I've talked about Jared Diamond uh, in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel and Collapse. Uh, that, that's not the watered down popular version of his theory. That is the theory, and anybody could read it. You can pick it up at an airport bookstall. Anybody can do it, right? So, uh, and of course, Steve Gould and Richard Dawkins, and, and our speaker today, I think, is just one of the stellar examples of this, Carol Tavris, in her numerous books throughout the years, Anger, the Misunderstood Emotion, uh, The Mismeasure of Woman, which was the, the compliment to Steve Gould's Mismeasure of Man, uh, and her new book, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, Carol, that is one of the cleverest titles. I'm just really upset I didn't think of that title. It's just a great title. I'm always racking my brains for book titles. Um, but again, here there's a huge body of scientific literature uh, in social science uh, that is not just popularized in these books. These books are representing a sort of theoretical integration of a huge swath of data that is hard to get your mind around. And it's a skill and an art. That's not popularization. It's part of actually being able to do science, to integrate. If you follow that simplistic model of technical science, popular science, Darwin's own book, Origin of Species, that is the book. There is no peer-reviewed paper he wrote or something. That is the theory. Anybody can read it. Again, that's part of doing good science. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Tavris has been doing that for uh, several years now uh, with these books and two textbooks. She has uh, on intro psych. Anyone who's taken intro psych has probably had uh, Dr. Tavers's books, and uh, so this one then is a nice integration of, well, you couldn't ask for a, a, a better intro, wasn't it, our uh, attorney general who said, mistakes were made, right? Uh, so there, I thought, he read her book. <laughs> by the way, I should know parenthetically, the first review of mistakes were made, but not by me, just came out in Oprah magazine uh, this last week, so congratulations, very positive. If you want to pick up a copy, it's the issue with Oprah on the cover. <laughs> wow, shocking. <laughs> so with that, please help me welcome Dr. Carol Tavers. Follow that. Is that what's meant by a warm-up act, I think? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Michael is one of my heroes, you know. He fights for the endangered species of science, skepticism, and sanity. And I've been a long admirer of his for, for so very long. So thank you, Michael. Um, 
and I really am so pleased to be here. A lot of people have been promoting my book lately, you'll have noticed. Uh, President Bush in January also said, uh, mistakes were made, uh, I think, maybe by someone, only I don't know exactly what they were, but if any did happen, whatever they might have been, I will take responsibility for them. <laughs> very, very popular title. So I want to start with a story when um, many years ago when the women's movement was first getting underway again and uh, everybody was very conscious of sexism and sexist matters and so forth. One of my best friends who was a professor at UCLA uh, raising her son uh, wanted him of course to be a non-sexist little boy and she comes into his room one day, he's a little kid and he's playing with his trains and he's got this fabulous train set and she says, uh, David, wonderful, I see you have here a male conductor and a male engineer on this train. Um, can't girls be engineers? This is the non-sexist mom, right? And he said, well, they can, but they don't want to. <laughs> So I think about that remark a lot these days because over the years of writing and teaching about the importance of critical and scientific thinking in psychology, let me tell you, that is an uphill battle. People think psychological science is an oxymoron. And I have found that the problem isn't just getting people to think scientifically. It's, that's hard enough. It's getting them to want to. And I say them advisedly because we have to want to ourselves. We are all of us much better at thinking scientifically and skeptically about hypotheses, about studies whose findings we don't like. But maybe it's a little harder when it comes to research that is important to us. So for example, the New York Times, <laughs> New York Times has the following research report. Several studies reported in the Journal of Nutrition showed that after eating chocolate, test subjects had increased levels of antioxidants in their blood. Chocolate contains flavonoids, antioxidants that have been associated with decreased risk of heart disease and stroke. Yes! <laughs> I knew it, I knew it! The next paragraph, uh, much of the research was funded by Mars Incorporated <laughs> and the Chocolate Manufacturers Association. These studies were small and preliminary and none were randomized, double blind trials. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> You might also have read that resveratrol is, that, is the ingredient that's been found in red wine that has all that wonderful life extending thing about the benefits of drinking red wine. Well, that's due to resveratrol. Turns out you have to drink 750 bottles of wine a day. <laughs> but hey, that's quibbling, so. Right. This is tough, see? This skepticism part is really tough. When I was a child, my father told me about the story of Ignaz Semmelweis, I'm sure you all know this, in 1847, and Semmelweis came on the reason that so many women were dying of childbed fever. Uh, the doctors, you know, he was observing that maybe, that maybe it has something to do with the morbid poison that the physicians were carrying from dealing with cadavers to the women in childbirth and causing them to, um, to die. And so Semmelweis instructed his students to wash their hands in a chlorine antiseptic solution. And it worked. Tremendous immediate effect. The women uh, whose attending physicians were washing their hands were less likely to die of childbed fever. Now that's data. That is pretty clear data, isn't it? Okay. Now it is true that Semmel Weiss had, as one of his biographers said, the temper of a rattlesnake. And he was not exactly a persuasive and amenable guy, but he had the data the reduced rates of death from childbed fever. Now, his colleagues, however, failed to say, thanks, Ignash, for giving us this wonderful information. They said, oh, sod off, Ignash, and take your stupid data with you. 
Now, the story of Semmelweis is usually told as a story of how things were in the bad old pre-scientific days before science and medicine, you know, were really based on good research and data. But let me tell you, I, you know, I was fascinated as a child by why Semmelweis's colleagues wouldn't listen to him. Their own patients are dying. Wouldn't you want the information to save their lives? So then I grew up and I realized that just about all of us have had the Semmelweis experience on one side or the other. We've all been in a situation where someone has offered us information that we really didn't want to hear. And so we told them quietly to go slot off and take their data with them. And we have all been in the position of Semmelweis, have we not? Where we knew the answer, we had the data, and what do people say to us? <clears throat> for example, um, many years ago, I wrote um, an essay for the New York Times on, it was a book review of all those books on recovered memory and incest survivors and so forth, the courage to heal and so forth. And all I did, all I did in that review was describe how misguided these books were in their assumptions about memory and trauma and recovery. It was information that would be in any Psych 101 class. Did clinicians write to me and say, oh, thanks, Carol, for pointing out that everything I'm doing in my therapy is wrong and that I have been harming my clients? <laughs> no, actually, most of them expressed their wish that I would go and have a pleasant sexual experience by myself. <laughs> It was disheartening. <laughs> so if our goal is to promote science and skepticism, we need also to promote the motivation to want to. And to do that, we need to understand the mental and motivational mechanisms that make us not want to, all of us. It means that as skeptics, we have to be as open to revealing the times when we shut our own minds to evidence in order to preserve a cherished beliefs, the mistakes we made. Um, it's not easy, and that's what I want to talk about uh, today. The motivational mechanism that underlies the reluctance to be wrong, to change our minds, to admit that we've made serious mistakes, and to be unwilling to accept, uh, and to be willing to accept unwelcome scientific findings is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, this is the 50th year that Leon Festinger's book, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, was published. And it was expanded by his student and my colleague, Elliot Aronson, into a theory of self-justification. 50 years, how many theories in psychology have lasted 50 months, let alone 50 years? <laughs> and let alone made its way into the popular media. It's been a question on Jeopardy. That means it's really got to be important. And last week, if anybody was watching The Daily Show, you might have seen Lewis Black, who said he was describing it as all those well-meaning people who give up using plastic uh, bags at the grocery market but drive gas-guzzling SUVs. He said they might as well be fill filling their gas tanks with cognitive dissonance. <laughs> we all know what cognitive dissonance feels like. When you're making a decision to do anything at all, to buy a car, to buy a house, you get all the information you can, you consider the pros, you consider the cons, and the minute you've made the decision, dissonance kicks in, and now you will do everything to justify the decision you made and to stop paying any attention to all those stupid ads for the car that you didn't buy. <laughs> so dissonance is, however, most painful. Not when it's just two cognitions that are in a crunch. Your best friend doesn't like the movie that you love most in the world. It's most painful when the dissonant information disputes how we see ourselves, when it challenges some belief that's central to our identity, or that questions a story that we have woven to explain our lives. When people do something that is inconsistent with something that's that important to them, they will be motivated to reduce the dissonance in a way that justifies what they did. The alternative is to change the self-concept or the central belief, and that is much harder to do. 
You all know these wonderful studies showing that 80% of people think that they're smarter than average, more competent than average, cuter than average, more wonderful than average. Everybody thinks they're better than average. And so indeed, when you get some information suggesting that maybe you're not more competent than average, you're going to be inclined to dismiss and ignore that evidence. If you have happened to do something that is unethical, that has harmed another person, well, how could this be? You're a good person. You're an ethical person. Obviously, you think the thing that you did must have been justified in some way. Look at Alec Baldwin and Kim Bassinger having a public row in the papers. This is the classic thing that happens in fierce divorcing couples. Notice neither of them feels responsible for their part in this terrible war. Each of them says, I'm a good, wonderful person and a good, terrific parent. But that other person, whoa, are they being awful. That justifies how awful I get to behave in retaliation. Now, self-justification is not the same thing as lying or making excuses. Of course, people are going to lie to try to get off the hook. If they've done something that they know is bad or if they've told a lie and they know it's untrue, to save face. When Alberto Gonzalez said mistakes were made, not, of course, that he could actually remember any of them, know anybody who might have made one, or what exactly the mistake was. Nobody was fooled. All he was doing was passing the buck and trying to save his job and his reputation. But when George Bush says mistakes were made, not, of course, about the war, not, of course, about anything to do with how he has managed this administration, I think that George Bush is a man who is cocooned in his self-justifications, who really does not think that he made any mistake about the decision to invade Iraq. He has blinded himself to the mountain of accruing dissonant information that he might have been colossally wrong. And the way we know this is that he's had every opportunity since the last election to save face by saying, country wants out of this war, my generals want out of this war, the Iraq study group has told me to get out of this war. I know what let's do. Let's send in more troops. <laughs> in this, he is no different from the dictator Baby Doc Duvalier, who put up a poster in Haiti saying, I should like to stand before the tribunal of history as the person who irreversibly founded democracy in Haiti. And it was signed, Jean-Claude Duvalier, president for life. <laughs> That's self-justification. Now, in the 50 years since Festinger wrote his wonderful book, more than 3,000 experiments have been done that not only support dissonance theory, but have drawn from research in memory and cognition to support its motivational components. And of course, brain science nowadays is not science unless you've trundled around in the brain and you show what's happening in the brain while you do something, but this study was particularly cute. Drew Weston and his colleagues observed people who were being monitored by fMRI while they were processing information about George Bush or John Kerry. Weston summarized the findings as follows. When participants were confronted with dissonant information about their preferred candidate, the reasoning, er the reasoning areas of the brain shut down. <laughs> when consonance was restored, the emotion circuits of the brain lit up happily. These mechanisms, Weston said, you know, the talk about the expression, once my mind is made up, don't bother me with the facts, it seems to have a neurological underpinning. <laughs> the brain's preference for only paying attention to information that we like, that supports what we believe, is called the confirmation bias. And it's the fact that we notice and remember information that confirms what we believe, suspect, or a decision that we've made. And we conveniently ignore, forget, dismiss, minimize, trivialize information that disconfirms it. Lenny Bruce described this bias wonderfully <laughs> in, a, in a, is this too, is this, okay. Is it all right, everybody? Okay. Um, in the Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960, Lenny Bruce said he was watching Nixon supporters and Kennedy supporters, and they're all watching these debates. And he said, I find an interesting thing is happening. The Nixon supporters all think their guy is trouncing Kennedy. And the Kennedy supporters say, can you see how terrific our guy is? That Nixon is such a moron. He said, 
They were watching the same debates, but they were seeing two different things. So he said, I realized that each group loved their candidate so much that a guy would have to be this blatant. He would have to look into the camera and say, I'm a thief. I'm a crook. Do you hear me? I am the worst choice you could ever make for the presidency. And even then, his supporters would say, now there's an honest man. <laughs> Takes a big guy to admit that. Just the kind of guy we need for president. <laughs> so Lenny Bruce, you know, was funny about this, but the confirmation bias is so strong that it can lead to tragedy and it can perpetuate disastrous decisions if people are not aware of it and do not find ways to correct for it. At its extreme, people will interpret the absence of evidence as evidence for what they want to believe. When Franklin Roosevelt made the terrible decision to uproot thousands of Japanese Americans and put them in internment camps for the duration of World War II, he did so entirely on the basis of rumors that Japanese Americans were planning to sabotage the war effort. Rumors. There was no proof, then or later, to support these rumors. The Army's West Coast commander, General John DeWitt, admitted that they had no evidence of sabotage or treason against a single Japanese American citizen. Quote, the very fact that no sabotage has taken place, he said, is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. <laughs> sure, and weapons of mass destruction will be found. <clears throat> so in a sense, dissonance theory is a theory of blind spots, cognitive blind spots, of how and why we blind ourselves so that we fail to notice vital events and information that might make us question <coughs> our beliefs, the decisions, the things we want to do. In the years since Festinger's book, so many findings from so many different areas have come to show this. For example, memories tend to be distorted in a self-justifying direction, usually in ways to confirm our present beliefs about ourselves. The way we think about ourselves now, the stories we tell now to explain our lives, will blur our memories, bringing our past selves into harmony with our present selves. There was one adorable study that was done, to talk about tenacity, these researchers studied 14-year-old boys and came back 34 years later to interview them and see what they remembered about their adolescences. What the guys said as 48-year-olds about what they were like as 14, chance no better than chance. They remembered themselves as being sexually adept, <laughs> outgoing, and lustful, whereas as 14-year-old boys, they were a little shyer than that, that kind of thing. But what this means is, it's why it is so jarring, it is so unsettling, when we get evidence that a memory might be wrong. Not only does it mean we have the first signs of dementia, <clears throat> It throws our story of our past into dissonance. You mean my father wasn't the monster I always thought he was? You mean I had something to do with that family rift that my memory tells me was entirely my sister's fault? Now, reducing dissonance normally is a kind of a one-time thing. As I say, in the matter of a car, you buy a car and dissonance and out. The greater problem occurs when people make a decision, justify it to reduce dissonance, and then find themselves on a path that they might not otherwise ever have anticipated. To illustrate this, let's take two students, two students who are pretty much the same in their attitudes toward cheating. They don't think it's a great thing, they don't think it's a terrible thing. It's not the worst crime in the world, but they personally really wouldn't want to do it. Now, here they are taking an important exam. So final exam in the course, this is really crucial. This grade is going to determine whether they get into medical school or have to be a mechanic, whatever. There they are, they're taking this exam. They draw a blank on a crucial question. Suddenly, the best student in the class who is sitting right in front of them, the one with that beautiful, large, legible handwriting, <laughs> has suddenly made her answer available. Now what do you do? Do you cheat or do you not cheat? 
After a long moment of indecision, one cheats, the other doesn't. Each gains something important, but at a cost. One gives up integrity for the grade, the other gives up the grade to preserve his integrity. Now, how do they feel about cheating a week later? Each student in that week will have had ample time to justify the action he took. The one who cheated will say, cheating is not such a big deal. Listen, everybody cheats. So what? Everybody does it. And besides, I really needed to do this for my future career. <laughs> when I was teaching at UCLA and I caught a student taking a final exam, she'd brought in her older brother who had taken the course to take the whole exam for her. And she said, but I had to cheat. Otherwise, I won't get into pharmacy school. <laughs> oh, good. I really, really want cheating pharmacists. <coughs> <laughs> this was not a persuasive argument, let me tell you. Okay. <clears throat> but the student who resists the temptation will now have decided that cheating is actually far more immoral than he originally thought. In fact, cheating is disgraceful. In fact, people who cheat should be permanently expelled. We should make an example of them. This study, um, well, I should say, let me just put it this way. <clears throat> By the time these two students have finished reducing dissonance and have justified the decision they took, two things will have happened. They will have grown further away from each other in their attitudes toward cheating, and they will have internalized their beliefs and come to believe that they have always felt this way about cheating. The metaphor that Elliot and I use in our book is it's as if they start off at the top of a pyramid, a millimeter apart. But by the time they have finished justifying their actions, a visual aid, this is about my level of technology, <laughs> we start here, but by the end, self-justification, self-justification, and here they are at the bottom of the pyramid, far apart. The one who didn't cheat will think the other is immoral and unethical, and the one who cheated will think the other is hopelessly puritanical and stuffy. This process illustrates how people who have been sorely tempted, battle temptation, and almost given into it, but resisted in the 11th hour, come to dislike, even despise, those who do not succeed in the same effort. Many years ago, Judson Mills did the cheating experiment with a group of school children, and this experiment has been replicated many times and in many other contexts. And the metaphor of the pyramid, I think, applies to so many important decisions that involve moral choices we might make, or life options, or intellectual choices. When I was growing up in Los Angeles, it was the time of the blacklist. <clears throat> And I recently met, uh, some years ago, excuse me, I met Christopher Trumbo, the son of Dalton Trumbo, the great blacklisted um, writer, screenwriter. And Christopher said to me, what do you remember about the adults' discussions? I said, what do you mean? He said, I remember the whispering. The minute he said this, I knew what he meant. The children of people who had been blacklisted or who were involved in any way in that world Remember our parents and friends having late night conversations talking about what to do. What to do. They didn't want to awaken us and they didn't want to worry us and so they always spoke quietly. And that's how we knew it was something important. And what were they discussing? These were friends, people who had worked together, had been close friends for years in Hollywood. Now, do they name names to the House on American Activities Committee or not? What do you do? The decisions were uh, momentous, impassioned, um, as you know. And so some people went one way, and some people went the other. And within a short period of time, the enmity had grown. Each side could not uh, appreciate or understand or respect the decisions made by the other side. <coughs> Countless decisions in our lives stay in a Bad relationship or get out. Blow the whistle on your company's unethical practices or play it safe. You're a therapist, accept a new therapeutic fad that seems to be getting good results or wait for the data. Should you pursue a demanding career or stay home with the kids? When there are benefits and costs of both choices or when the consequences are unclear, 
a person will feel a particular urgency to justify the choice made. And this is the, there's nothing wrong with making a choice, but the problem that happens next is they will start looking for confirming evidence to support the wisdom of that choice, and they will start ignoring and overlooking evidence that they might have made another one. And so you find this process of entrapment, of taking action, justifying it, and further action that increases our commitment to one course of action over another. <coughs> Excuse me. We could have seen this with the district attorney Michael Nifong in the Duke Lacrosse case. Once he decided, for whatever reasons, political pressure or for the pursuit of justice, once he decided to believe the woman who accused the lacrosse players of raping her, he never scrutinized her story. He didn't cross-examine her. He didn't look for disconfirming evidence that some problems in her story. He then went so far as we know he crossed a legal and ethical line, dismissing the exculpatory evidence of the DNA. I suppose by that time he was convinced, so convinced that those lacrosse players were guilty, he probably said, well, okay, so there's no DNA, so uh, they raped her and uh, then they ejaculated two days later. <laughs> So the point here is that dissonance theory predicts it's not only bad people who do bad things. More often, the greater problem comes from good people who do bad things in order to preserve their belief that they're good people. In our book, we try to show how this operates in many different contexts. The police, prosecutors, politicians, scientists, psychotherapists, warring families, warring nations, um, fiercely divorcing couples. In every domain, you will find people at, the, at one end of the bell curve who are ethical and who have always done the right thing, even when the right thing means admitting you've done the wrong thing. And at the other end, there are the Jack Abramoffs and the Randy Cunninghams who take bribes and the scientists who fake their data to win fame and fortune and corrupt prosecutors, the whole bunch. But our greatest danger comes from the well-meaning people in the middle who believe in their integrity and because of their blind spots, do not see how it can be compromised. Remember when Supreme Court Justice Scalia went duck hunting with Dick Cheney, even though Cheney had a case pending before the Supreme Court? A few people thought that might have been a conflict of interest and he should recuse himself. <laughs> Scalia was indignant and he wrote to the LA Times saying, I do not think my impartiality could reasonably be questioned. How come we can question it? And he can't. But he is no different in that respect from scientists who cannot see how being funded by a corporate funder might influence the kind of research they do and the kind of findings they get, might affect their inclination to suppress findings that their funder doesn't want to hear. No different from physicians who can't see how a trinket from a drug rep might influence whether they prescribe that lobbyist, uh, that rep's drug. Just, I'm above being contaminated by a trinket. I mean, that's not gonna, that's, I mean, give me $100,000 if you're gonna give me a bribe, but a pizza? I'm not gonna do anything because of a pizza. You know, I can't be bought with a couple of sandwiches. But actually, the evidence shows that most physicians are influenced more by small gifts than by big ones. Because of the power of reciprocity, once they take the gift, no matter how small, they've taken the first step down the pyramid. They will feel the urge to give a little something back, maybe just their attention, maybe their willingness to listen. Eventually, they become more willing to give their prescription or their ruling in a case or their vote. Their behavior slowly changes as they fall down the pyramid but their view of themselves as professionals of integrity remains untouched. That's the power of self-justification. <coughs> the moral of this story is that all of us, from time to time, are gonna find ourselves at the top of a pyramid, and that's as it should be. We all of us go through our lives making incredibly important decisions, ethical ones and intellectual ones, pragmatic ones, and our lives are full of passionate commitments, and they should be. We don't want to live a life constantly weighing, is this good or is that good, and so forth. You couldn't live. You couldn't get past breakfast every day. 
We must keep in mind the words of the great Texas writer, Jim Hightower, who once said, the only things that belong in the middle of the road are yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> <laughs> he was wonderful, I must say. The danger occurs when we have a passionate commitment and we keep it too long, when it's time to let it go. And we have blinded ourselves so that we don't let it go. So in that respect, I want to tell you a dissonance story from my own life. When the McMartin preschool scandal first hit the news in 1984, we, the public, were at the top of our own pyramid. How are we going to respond to this? Peggy McMart McMartin and her two grown children who ran this preschool were accused of being pedophiles and doing horrible things to the children in their care. Do we, do we say, oh my god, what a horrible thing? Or do we think maybe this could be a witch hunt? Should we be skeptical? Which way did you step? Now I want to tell you that it embarrasses me to this day, and that's why I'm telling you this story. A mistake was made by me, and it's painful. Because I initially believed that breathless media coverage that the preschool teachers were guilty. Uh, Elliot uh, and I were talking about this actually as we were writing our book, and he, had, he said he also had been inclined to believe they were guilty, and he had a wonderful expression for this. He said, we sacrificed our skepticism on the altar of outrage. That's exactly right. I knew at the time a, a developmental psychologist who'd been studying children's uh, testimony, and she really persuaded me that kids need to be pressed by some leading questions before they will tell you that a doctor examined their genitals in an office and so forth. And uh, she was of the Believe the Children's School. And I respected her research at the time. And uh, we knew the prosecutor. And yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Justify, justify, justify. So when the um, years-long trial eventually came to a conclusion with a hung jury, I wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times on this research by my colleague and friend about the need to press children a little bit or they won't tell. And the Times titled my op-ed, Do Children Lie? Not About This. Um, a couple of years later, at a conference where some developmental psychologists were talking about the research, showing that, oh yes, children do lie about this, just as adults do, and more likely that they can be induced to say that something happened when it did not, he showed a slide <laughs> of that LA Times piece and its <laughs> title, which of course I didn't give it. Let me tell you about dissonance, my friends. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> So here's the point. Um, I eventually learned what the research had to say, the really excellent research about how to interview children in a way that increases the likelihood that they will tell the truth and not respond in a way that you uh, want them to. And months, months after the McMartin trial ended, the full story finally came out about the emotionally disturbed mother who's made the first accusation and who's whose claims got crazier and crazier until finally even the prosecutors wouldn't talk to her, um, about how the children had been coerced and pressured to tell by social workers who were on a zealous moral crusade and who would never accept the children's denials, about how the children's stories became increasingly outlandish. One child said, yes, we were tortured by clowns on a plane. <laughs> Flying in a plane on a preschool teacher's salary? I don't think so. So the story eventually became clear, thanks to science and skepticism, what really had been going on there. Now, I was at least, thanks to science and skepticism, able to stop my fall down this pyramid. But I'll tell you that I had a visceral understanding of what it might have been like for the people who went further down the pyramid than I did in the Martin case and its many copycat scandals across the country. Those people who unskeptically believed the children put that view out for public consumption. The thousands of psychotherapists, psychiatrists, and social workers who considered themselves their core identity, skilled clinicians, and advocates for children's rights. 
how open were they going to be to the accumul accumulating evidence from developmental psychologists that it was their own confirmation bias combined with zealotry and belief that the children had been abused that was getting these children to, to tell. So I understand Semmelweis's colleagues. If you are in any of the healing professions and you learn that some of the beliefs that guide your practice are wrong, you have two choices. You have dissonance to resolve. You must either admit you were wrong and change your approach or reject the new evidence. If the mistakes aren't too threatening to your view of your competence, if you've not taken a public stand promoting them, or if your attitude toward mistakes is gratitude, grateful to mistakes because after all, that's what's going to help you do your work better, you'll change what you do. But if some of your mistaken beliefs have made your patients or your clients' problems worse, torn up your client's family, or sent innocent people to prison, it is much easier to dismiss the disconfirming research as the work of pedophiles, misguided fools, or the popular one, perpetrators of a backlash against women and children. The concluding section of the third edition of The Courage to Heal is called Honoring the Truth, a Response to the Backlash. There is no section called Honoring the Truth. We made some whopping big mistakes. And so in this respect, the mental health practitioners who promulgated the daycare sex abuse witch hunts like those who promulgated recovered memory therapy or any of the other therapy fads that sweep the nation from time to time are no different from Semmelweis's fellow physicians for whom the need to justify the harm they caused ensured that they kept repeating it. <clears throat> Science and skepticism are therefore our most powerful antidotes to the confirmation bias and to self-justification. But you don't have to be doing science to think scientifically, and you don't have to be a scientist to let go of the self-justifications that cover up our mistakes and that try to minimize the hurts we inflict on those we love. For me, the most moving aspect of writing this book was finding examples of those rare individuals who had the courage and the honesty and the self-awareness to let go of self-justification, to admit the mistakes they'd made, even at enormous painful cost to themselves and, or to their occupations. And in every chapter, we found somebody who was able to do that. And I think that those stories are, in a way, a more powerful example of the impulse to reduce dissonance in a way that protects ourselves rather than allows us to admit our errors. Here's one. At the age of 65, the feminist writer and activist Vivian Gornick wrote an essay reflecting on her lifelong efforts to balance work and love. I remember reading Vivian Gornick in the 70s and the 80s. She was a great feminist inspiration to all. And her goal, she said, was always to live a life based on egalitarian principles in work and love. Quote, I'd written often about living alone because I couldn't figure out why I was living alone, she said. For years, her answer was sexism. Patriarchal men were forcing strong, independent women like her to choose between their careers and their relationships. That answer isn't wrong. We all know sexism has sunk many, many relationships. But today, Gornick realizes it was not the full answer. Looking back, she was able to see her own role in determining the course of her relationships. She wrote, quote, I realized that much of my loneliness was self-inflicted, having more to do with my angry, self-divided personality than with sexism. The reality was that I was alone, not because of my politics, but because I did not know how to live in a decent way with another human being. In the name of equality, I tormented every man who'd ever loved me until he left me. I called them on everything, never let anything go, held them up to accountability in ways that wearied us both. There was, of course, more than a grain of truth in everything I said. 
But those grains, no matter how numerous, need not have become the sand pile that crushed the life out of love. Yeah, wow. Gives me goosebumps. I think the courage it took for Gornick to admit this, to resist the impulse, to blame the men in her life, to stop self-justification in its tracks long enough to see her own part in her own life story. Consider, too, how much better it might have been for her if she had been able to stop that slide down the pyramid a bit earlier in her life. Gornick shows that we can stop the slide, and with understanding and patience and willingness, we can do it sooner. When it comes to decisions affecting the lives of others, we must learn to do it sooner. And we must make sure that corrective mechanisms are in place for those who will not do so on their own. Self-justification lets us sleep at night without suffering excessive remorse over re mistakes we made and things we wished we had done. But you know what? Sometimes a few sleepless nights are called for. I want a president who has a few sleepless nights <laughs> over a decision that has cost the lives of upwards of 100,000 people, and I count Iraqis as people. I want district attorneys. <laughs> I want district attorneys and detectives to go after the bad guys, but I wanted them to do it the way they do it on CSI. <laughs> where they stop in mid-track and say, wait, another hypothesis. Maybe there's disconfirming evidence. Maybe we'll try it this other way. If they can do it on CSI, why can't our guys do it? <laughs> Doubt is not the enemy. Arrogance is the enemy. And when a decision is made, and even if it is the best one at that time, and then it proves to be wrong, I want our leaders and our professionals to be able to own up without waffling and blaming others. And it has been done, and it can be done. In June 1944, at the invasion of Normandy, which was no means going to be a slam dunk. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There's one person who's thinking. You may not know this. Dwight Eisenhower actually had prepared in advance, in longhand, a short speech he planned to release if the invasion had failed. This, an aide later found this note in Eisenhower's shirt pocket. This note read in its entirety, our landings in the Cherbourg Havre area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. Actually, the handwriting says, the troops have been withdrawn. And he crossed that out and said, I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the Air Force, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Shall we send that to another Republican president? <laughs> what this suggests is that the brain's biases and blind spots may be hardwired, but how we think about mistakes and failure is not. By articulating the cognitions that create dissonance, we can keep them separate. I'm a decent, smart, good, capable person, and I did this dopey thing, and I remain a good, smart, sensible person, and the dopey thing remains a dopey thing. Now, what do I do next? How do I correct the mistake that I made? How do I atone for it? How do I apologize for it? And most important, how do I see that it does not occur in the future? When we promote skepticism, we can do it in a way that shows that thinking this way leads to better life-saving ideas. Don't we want our doctors to wash their hands? Don't we want better ways of interviewing children? Don't we want detectives to catch the right culprit? Don't we want psychotherapists to abandon methods that are harmful? Um, for scientists and anyone else who loves the quest for discovery and knowledge, being wrong is not dissonant. This is a lesson for anybody, scientist and otherwise. It's exciting, it's part of the process, and it is just as informative as being right, as Michael said so beautifully. As the great scientist Richard Feynman said, and Michael and I have different versions of this quote, he said it a thousand times to his Caltech students. 
If your guess about how things work disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. He was a fabulous scientist. He had not studied social psychology. <laughs> so I am going to end with one last story. I love this story. The story is told of a woman in a little uh, retirement community. And the retirement community decides to get together and have an auction and a fundraiser for, the, for everybody. And everybody brings in something to auction off, a painting, a lamp, whatever they have. And one woman stands up and says, any man who can guess what I'm holding in the palm of my hand wins a night of love with me. <laughs> and a man in the back of the room yells, an elephant. <laughs> And she says, close enough. <laughs> My friends, as self-justifying human beings, we will never get to the perfection of Feynman's ideal. But we can get closer, and sometimes close enough. <laughs>